this hospital since we opened seven years ago. And uh, we've been giving these uh, talks on knee replacement for uh, several years now. I appreciate you all coming out. I wanted to give you uh, some brief information about myself. I've been in practice out here in Northwest Houston for almost 19 years. Um, a significant part of my practice is knee surgery, probably about 70%. The other thing I do a lot of is, is shoulder surgery. Um, there have been a lot of exciting advancements. <laughs> I see a patient in, of mine in the back that's had both actually. So uh, there have been, in my opinion, a lot of exciting advancements in knee replacement surgery over the last four or five years. And I'd like to share some of those advancements with you. So we'll start, I've, I've titled this talk, Patient Specific Partial and Total Knee Replacement. I think one of the most exciting things that have happened or that has happened in total knee replacement technology in the past several years has been customizing the implantation of total knees to a patient. Um, years ago when these things first started getting developed and implanted in the 1970s, uh, there were several sizes available. Not always did they fit well. Uh, that's been refined over the years. But what's been gaining popularity and acceptance over the past three to five years in particular is customizing the implantation technique to the patient. And so I want to share some of that technology with you, what's being developed and what we're using here at this hospital. Uh, so just a brief outline of this talk, we'll, uh, after this brief introduction, we'll talk about causes of knee pain, uh, treatment options, which uh, always include no surgery as an option, uh, options, of course, that include surgery. Uh, we'll have some conclusions and then plenty of time for questions. This talk tends to run about 30 minutes, so there'll be plenty of times for Q&A at the end. So we'll start by talking about types of arthritis. You know, the most common type of arthritis by far is what's called osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear type of arthritis <coughs> that most people are familiar with. If, if your grandmother or grandfather had arthritis, more than likely they had osteoarthritis. That's something that tends to run in families and tends to occur more frequently with age. There's also post-traumatic arthritis. If you've been unlucky enough to have had an accident in the past and broken your knee or torn a ligament, and may or may not have had surgery to repair that, years down the road that can develop arthritis as well, which is independent of your DNA, but completely dependent on your prior injury and surgery history. Uh, we have different types of inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Those things can strike at any age and can tend to be uh, very rapidly progressive and sometimes very devastating. The medical treatment of these types of arthritis um, has gotten very good over the past decade or so. And so uh, we see less and less of those types of knees coming to surgery, but still that happens uh, fairly commonly. And then finally, we have uh, what's called crystalline arthro arthropathy, where different chemicals in your bloodstream can precipitate out in the joint fluid that surrounds your knee and cause arthritis. The most common type of that is, is gout that I think most of you have heard of, or a variant of that called pseudogout. So those are all the, the common types. Osteoarthritis, I think, by far and away is the most common, probably 80%, 85% of what I see in my office on a day-to-day -day basis. So what exactly is arthritis? We throw this term out all the time, but we never really talk about what it is. A normal knee, any joint for that matter, has uh, cartilage that covers the joint surfaces, and that cartilage is typically very smooth, almost like glass, and so it allows the joint to slide easily when you move it. So when you move your knee back and forth, there's a gliding motion that occurs without any catching or uh, binding or any pain. When you develop uh, arthritis, what that actually means is you develop loss of that cartilage or damage or deterioration of that cartilage so that that normally smooth surface becomes somewhat roughened and irregular. So now you can imagine instead of having two smooth surfaces gliding across one another when you bend your knee, you have something that looks like the picture on the right-hand side of the screen, which are these divots or these cracks in the cartilage which hang up when they glide against one another and expose nerves that should not be exposed and leads to pain and stiffness and difficulty with everyday activities, such as just walking, uh, walking to the car or walking to the kitchen. Uh, these are some pictures I took from um, some of the surgery that I do. I do not only knee replacement surgery, I do a, a lot of arthroscopic surgery. And so the picture on the left is a normal knee. And I think that if you look at this, you can see the very, very smooth, you know, completely white, homogeneous appearance of the cartilage above and below the joint and the nice little cartilage spacer or the meniscus in between. And contrast that to the picture on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see all these little pock marks or divots and these little you know, fronds of cartilage hanging off. So you can imagine how this knee would probably feel pretty good when it moves back and forth, but this knee would not. And this is what an arthritic knee looks like early on before the cartilage is completely lost. 
We have lots of treatment options for arthritis. You know, if you've ever been to your doctor complaining of knee pain or ever been diagnosed with arthritis, you've probably been told at one point or another to exercise and lose weight. It applies to a lot of us. And uh, that's sometimes easier said than done. We prescribe anti-inflammatory medications, and there are lots of those available. Advil or Aleve or Motrin are the ones that are available over the counter. Uh, we also have prescription medications, things that you may have seen advertised on television or in magazines like Celebrex is a very common one, uh, Relafin, Mobic, those types of medications. Medications work well to a certain extent. They take away some of the inflammation and they take away some of the pain. Any medication, of course, has side effects, and a lot of people already take enough pills as it is and would rather not take more pills if they can avoid it. So that's one option we use in mild cases, but it's not always successful. As a second line of therapy, when, when medications aren't an option or when people have tried them and they fail, we, we try different types of injections. There are, there's a variety of these medications that are commercially available. They're called visco supplements, which basically is just like a gel or a lubricant for the knee. One that we use commonly is this medication in the lower right-hand cor corner called Synvisc. And it's, it looks like water, but it's got the consistency more or less of a thick motor oil. And what we can do is numb up the knee in the office and inject this medication. And it serves as a lubricant, so those roughened, irregular surfaces slide and move more freely, freely and more naturally. It works very well. It's covered by most insurances, including Medicare. But the downside is that it tends to wear off relatively quickly. I mean, m most people can get about four to six months of relief from these medications. After that, the results start to decline. So we use these very commonly when people have pain but aren't quite ready to pull the trigger on surgery or just need to get through something important coming up in their life, like a wedding or some sort of important social event. So these are valuable to us as well. If you talk about uh, different types of treatments, of course, we've already talked about the earliest forms of intervention, which are the medications and the weight control that, that I mentioned. We try different types of prescription medications, physical therapy, and injections. Physical therapy is kind of a controversial one. Uh, you know, it's, it's helpful to have strong muscles that surround the knee joint. When your muscles are weak, then the, then the uh, the contact forces between the bones of the knee becomes greater and can increase the pain. But when you've got arthritis that's so bad that you've basically lost the cartilage and you're rubbing bone against bone, there's not a whole lot generally that physical therapy is going to do for you. But that's something that we try in cases other than end stage cases of arthritis. But when none of these things work, we turn to different types of surgery, particularly knee replacement, as a solution for a number of people. If you look at the number of knee replacements performed annually in the United States, you can look at this graph that shows a pretty constant rise in the incidence of knee replacements over the last 12 or 13, what is that, actually 15 years now. 800,000 total knee replacements approximately were performed in the U.S. last year, and this is only going up, which is obviously a very important public health concern as we talk about things like Obamacare and Medicare reform. So if you come to the office or if you see a doctor for knee arthritis, you might be asked one or more of these questions to determine how significant a problem this is for you. Does your knee hurt one or more days per week? Does the pain interfere with your sleep? Is it painful for you to walk more than a block? Are your pain medications no longer working? Is knee pain limiting your participation in activities? Has, the, has inactivity from knee pain caused you to gain weight? That's a common one. People come in all the time and say, you know, all you doctors keep telling me to lose weight. How can I lose weight if I can't even walk? Can you limit activities for a few months to recover from surgery? That's a very important question because surgery isn't an overnight fix. It's a process that takes uh, not only the day of surgery but several months after year, afterwards to recover from. And are you willing to commit to working hard during the rehab for a successful recovery? So those are all important questions to ask yourself. So let's look at a few uh, knee replacement facts. Uh, knee replacement surgery is a successful operation. If it weren't, we wouldn't be doing 800,000 of these annually in the United States. But in general, about 85% of people that go through knee replacement surgery would say that they're satisfied. And if they had the opportunity to do that operation over, they would do it again. So that's pretty good. But you, know, but you should also know that although knee replacement can be done safely and effectively, there are numerous potential drawbacks of knee surgery. The performance of a joint replacement depends on a lot of factors, including your age and your weight and your activity level. There are potential risks, including infection and other things, and that recovery does take a period of time. 
people with infections or other conditions limiting rehab, uh, severe obesity, um, bad lungs, bad heart that wouldn't allow them to exercise afterwards might not be able to successfully rehabilitate after the surgery. And there are several potential complica complications which could occur afterwards, which could result in stiffness or unsatisfaction with your, knee, your, with your new knee, including loosening of the implant where it attaches to the bone or fracturing of the bone that surrounds the implant or the components can wear out. I think, you know, the last thing, this wearing out of the components used to be a problem 10, 15, 20 years ago, but as materials have improved and the science of metals and plastics that are used to improve these knee implant designs has improved, uh, the wearing out of the components is much less of a concern. We don't see that really to any large extent today as we did 10, 15 years ago. So in my opinion, 85% is good. I mean, that's at least a B or B plus, but what about the other 15% of people? And so this is what modern science, modern orthopedic surgery is dedicated towards doing is improving the outcomes of knee replacement so that we can get a greater satisfaction rate and we can improve on the people that haven't been so satisfied with their knee replacement. So let's talk a little bit about what those improvements might be that might improve the outcomes of knee replacement. I think you can broadly think about this in two categories. There's the type of knee replacement, just like there's different kinds of cell phones or televisions or watches or what have you. There are a number of different types of knee replacement. And then there's the technique of knee replacement. Assuming that you choose the right knee replacement or you choose the right doctor to put it in for you, you have to rely on that doctor to put it in correctly. There are numerous important steps that are um, essential for getting the knee to work properly. And so we'll spend a few minutes over the next five or 10 minutes talking about not only the types of knee replacements that I think are exciting, but the techniques of putting these in that really improve the outcomes. So let's talk about types. Um, there's lots and lots of brands of knee replacement, but in general, they all boil down to one of two different types. There's partial knee replacements, which, which I think uh, most of you have heard of, or total knee replacements. Partial knee replacements, as the, knee, as the name suggests, involves replacing just the part of the knee that's worn, whereas a total knee replacement is, perf is performing a replacement of the entire knee joint. And then there's techniques. You know, we, for many, many years since the 70s, have relied on instruments, or, or jigs, if you will, that help us as surgeons size and align the components properly during surgery. You know, everybody's knee is a little bit different, but we have to get the implant in straight. We have to get it in properly rotated, and we have to put in the correct size or else the ligaments and the muscles and the tendons that surround the knee won't balance properly and it won't feel right. But the evolution in these implantation techniques over the last several years has included use, the use of computers to assist us in these different alignment and rotation and sizing decisions that we make. So we can use computers both before surgery, which we do commonly now, and I'll explain that in a minute. We can use computers during surgery while we're actually implanting the device, or we can do both. And I'll talk to you about what I commonly do now and routinely do and, and the reasons that I do that. So here we go. Here's, we're talking back now about types of knee replacement. The picture on the left, as you can see, has less metal, which is the white stuff here, than the picture on the right. So this picture on the left is a, is a uh, photograph of an x-ray of a, of a partial knee replacement. And you can see that the inner part of the knee on the femur, which is the end of the thigh bone, and the upper part of the tibia has been replaced with a knee replacement part, but that the rest of the knee, the outer side of the knee, has been untouched. And sort of take a mental picture of that and contrast it to this total knee replacement x-ray where the entire femur or the entire end of the thigh bone has been replaced as has the upper end of the tibia bone. And I think you can see very clearly that there's got to be some you know, pretty significant differences in how these implants work and how they're implanted. So let's talk just briefly about the knee. We, we as surgeons typically divide the knee into three compartments. We have what's called the medial compartment, which, was the, which is the inside part of your knee where the knees touch one another as you're sitting still. We have the lateral compartment, which is the outside part of the knee, out towards the outside part of your body. And then we have what's called the anterior compartment or the patellofemoral compartment, which is where your kneecap sits. And so if we're going to choose to do a partial knee replacement, we can replace this part, or we can replace that part, or we can replace the part behind the kneecap. Whereas if we do a total knee replacement, we replace the whole thing. This is what a total knee replacement looks like. This is um, 
uh, fairly common for most of the, the major manufacturers of knee implants uh, that currently sell these in North America. The implants are almost universally made out of metal. The metal is shiny. It's a cobalt chromium alloy is what most uh, of the companies use now. So you've got cobalt chrome metal up above which caps the end of the thigh bone. You've got some cobalt chrome metal down below which goes into the shin bone or the tibia. And then you've got a piece of high molecular weight medical grade plastic or polyethylene that goes in between. And so if you remember back about 10 or 15 slides when I showed you the, the cartoon of the arthritic knee with the little pock marks and the divots in it, we're taking those roughened surfaces and placing instead a cap, if you will, on the end of the bone that's perfectly smooth and polished and made of metal. And that cap is going to move against or articulate with this polished high density, high molecular weight piece of plastic. And that's what makes the knee feel smooth again and feel normal. So I'm sorry if this is too graphic for some of you, but it's important, I think, to know what, what a total knee is. I mean, a, this is um, a little bit of an exaggerated photo because this is um, sort of an older technique of implanting one of these devices. But what it involves is actually opening the knee with an incision, you know, sometimes 8 or 10 or even 12 inches long, moving this, the muscles and tendons out of the way, and then using different instruments like the one you see in the lower left-hand corner and the lower right-hand corner to align the devices and then using actually power saws and drills to prepare the bone in a way that will accept the new component. So that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. So, <laughs> And so this is what it looks like um, in a cartoon graphic. When you, when you take a knee and look at it from the side, in order to implant the prosthesis or the new knee replacement, you have to remove segments of bone in order to fit on the metal pieces that are designed to cover the uh, ends of the bone. And there's no way to really do that without removing segments of bone. And so most of the modern knee implants involve typically about five cuts. One, two, three, four, five. To take what was sort of a roundish looking bone and turn it into a multifaceted bone that we can then cement the new prosthesis into place. That's, and that's what it looks like once it's implanted. So total knee replacements work well, but what if this is your problem? This is a picture of an x-ray of a patient who has pain on the inner part of the knee, the medial compartment where the bones touch one another, and you can see that there's something missing, right? There's no space between the bones, which indicates that the cartilage that covers the bones has completely worn out and worn thin. But look at the outer side of the knee, a nice wide space, meaning normal cartilage, so this particular individual has arthritis due to the, the fact that the cartilage has deteriorated in one part of the knee, but not the other parts. So it would seem a shame, maybe, to have to replace the whole entire knee if only a part of the knee is worn. So here are a few things that we know about partial knee replacements. There are a number of acceptable products. There's about five or six ma major manufacturers of these implants in the world, uh, most of them based in North America. And the decision on which of these implants to use is dependent on both the physician and the patient. And there's not a wrong answer. There are many, many good implants out there which can solve this problem of arthritis involving just part of the knee. I want to talk to you about uh, something that I've been doing at this hospital for about the past three and a half years, which has been using patient-specific implants to solve the problem of arthritis. Um, these are pictures of partial knee replacements from a company based out of Boston that has a proprietary technology for actually making implants specific to your body so that rather than as surgeons and as patients having to choose between size one, two, three, four, five, what we actually do is we take images of your knee and then have the company make the knee replacement that fits your knee, which makes a lot of sense to me. And so if you look at these pictures, on the left, this is what's called a unicompartmental knee replacement, which replaces just the ends of the bones that are worn on either the inner or outer part of the knee, or what's called a duocompartmental knee replacement, where we take, take this implant and extend it around the front of the knee in case the kneecap is worn. This by far is more commonly implanted than this one over here, but I'm showing them to you both just to let you know that they exist. 
And so the question is, why would you want to choose a partial knee replacement over a, over a total knee replacement? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. When you implant a partial knee replacement, you're removing only the part of the knee that's diseased and you're leaving the rest of it that's, that's normal uh, alone. And so in, in my opinion, um, what God gave you is always going to be better than what man made. So if we can keep part of your knee that's still good, that to me is an advantage. But, even, but just as importantly, all of the modern total knee replacements that are available on the market involve cutting at least one of the ligaments in the knee, which is called the ACL. And so if you cut a ligament in the knee, there is going to be some motion in the knee or some looseness that wasn't present before which isn't the end of the world. We have ways that the mechanical engineers have figured out to get around that. But if you can implant a part, a part of the knee that doesn't cut any ligaments, which is what these partial knee replacements do, and leave your normal ligaments alone, and leave the rest of your knee alone that's not involved with arthritis or disease, and that would seem to be a pretty good choice. So why would we choose these? Well, in general, if you're young, if you're one of these uh, guys or women that have had two or three ACL operations or have broken your knee and had surgery and you're 38 or 40 or 42 years old, but you've got now end-stage arthritis to the point where you can't play with your kids and you, you know, can't go out dancing with your wife or what have you, then a partial knee replacement might be a good idea because it, you're, you're going to re remain very active and you're going to want a knee that feels as natural and as normal as possible. Conversely, if you're very old and you're not very active, you're you know, winding down in life and, and taking things much easier than you used to, then you may not need to have your entire knee replaced. You may be perfectly happy, happy having only the part of the knee that's the worst part replaced and having a surgery that's much easier to recover from. In order to have this, you have to have normal knee ligaments. If you don't, then this operation doesn't work. You have to have no inflammatory arthritis, which means you can't have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or gout. Otherwise, we're concerned about arthritis spreading to other parts of the knee. Can't have an infection. You can't have any gross malalignment, meaning that if you're terribly bow-legged or if you're extremely knock-kneed, this uh, procedure doesn't tend to work so well. And you have to have arthritis confined to only one part of the knee. So if these partial knees are so good, why, why do we do total knees? Um, total knee replacement is still, by far and away, the most commonly done procedure um, for knee replacement, and there are a number of reasons for that. Most people don't have arthritis that's confined to only one part of their knee. They have it all over the knee. And so if you have arthritis in two or more of your knee compartments that we just talked about, then a total knee replacement is a better operation. Many, many people that have had arthritis for years and years and have put this off become either bow-legged or knock-kneed because of the wear pattern of the arthritis, and they're no longer a candidate for a partial knee. And so we, that's another reason why we do total knee replacements. Uh, lots of people that develop arthritis have had ligament tears in the past, especially ACL tears. And if you don't have a functioning knee ligament, uh, total knee replacement is a much better option for you. Or if you've got one of these other conditions, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or gout, this is a much better procedure. So the partial knee advantages would include smaller incisions. You know, typically we put these in through about three or four inch incisions as opposed to seven or eight inch incisions for total knees. Um, we were able to preserve the ligaments that I was talking to you guys about a few minutes ago, including the ACL, so that many people that have these, and they, you ask them how it feels, we're actually in, involved in a multi-center uh, national study on the outcomes of these patient-specific partial knees. But when we interview these patients in our office two or three years after the procedure, they just say it feels more natural. It feels, it feels like it's my knee. It doesn't feel like it's an artificial knee, a knee, and that's what we're looking for. Um, the hospital stay is hardly ever more than one night. Most people have this done uh, in the morning and go home the following morning. So that's a good thing as well. And the recovery is quicker. We're not cutting as much um, skin. We're certainly not cutting any muscles or tendons, and we're not cutting out any ligaments so that people can recover from this typically quicker than they would a total knee replacement. The disadvantages are that if you're developing some mild arthritis in other parts of your knee, um, you could still have some pain or your pain, your arthritis may progress over time. Let's say that you have a fairly normal looking knee regarding the rest of it that wasn't replaced at the time of surgery. Over the course of time, you know, three or five or seven or ten years, you could develop arthritis in those parts of the knee which would make you unhappy with your knee replacement and have to have it replaced or, or swapped out for a total knee replacement. And so when we talk about this in the office, which is a conversation that I have many times every day, we have to talk about the pros and cons of what, what's likely to happen with your knee and what may happen with your knees. 
Um, if you're on the, on the bubble, meaning that you have, you're really, really wanting a partial knee replacement for a number of reasons, but I see that you're developing arthritis in one part of your knee, and I'm concerned about the progression of that over time, I'll probably push you towards a total knee because ideally you'd like the first surgery that you have on your knee to be the last surgery, at least the first surgery that I do, I'd like for it to be your last surgery because nobody wants to go through this over and over again. <coughs> The advantages of a total knee replacement, on the other hand, are, is exactly that, that if you have the whole knee replaced, there's nothing left to replace. It's like having the whole engine rebuilt. You know, you can, you can swap out a piston or a ring and then other parts can go bad, or it's like buying a new car. Once it's replaced, you have a new knee, so it's likely to be your last replacement. And in general, we have much more um, historical data, historical information on total knee replacements. Literally millions of total knees have been implanted whereas really just hundreds of thousands of partial knee replacements have been implanted. So we can go back through different types of devices, um, uh, geographic reasons at regions of the country, you know, parts of the world or what have you, and we have lots and lots and lots of data on total knee replacement, whereas the results of partial knee replacement is not as robust. It's not, we don't have as much information. So we can tell you with a lot more confidence what will happen with a total knee than we can with a partial knee. The disadvantages of total knee replacement is that the surgery is more complex. Um, there's a little bit more work involved. It's technically more demanding to implant one of these devices. And so most patients do have a little bit more pain and swelling initially. Um, the hospital stay is longer. It's still not long. I mean, most patients at this hospital go home after the second day rather than the first day. Our average hospital stay here, and we've done um, close to 2,500 uh, joint replacements here since we opened is something like 2.3 days, I believe. So um, it's still not forever, but it's a day longer. And the recovery can definitely be a little bit more difficult. Uh, partial knee replacements typically come into the office two weeks after surgery to get their stitches out, and they're walking fairly normally and relatively happy with their knee, whereas the uh, total knee replacements may still be using you know, a walker or a cane or something to help support their weight and assist them because they just haven't quite gotten there yet. So which is better? Well, <laughs> that depends on a whole variety of factors. In my practice, and I do probably about 120 to 150 knee replacements annually. I do lots and lots of knee surgery, but 120 to 150 knee replacements, about 10 to 15% of patients that I see for arthritis are candidates for partial knee replacements. So by far and away, the majority of people that need knee replacement surgery are better served by a total knee replacement. So we've talked now about types of implants. That was the first broad category that I wanted to cover. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about technique or the way that we put these implants in because I think that's every bit as important, as important if not more important, and more important than the type of implant that we use. And so I'd like to talk to you about just a few abbreviations that we use. One is uh, Computer Assisted Surgery or CAS. And I'm gonna talk to you about how I use computers to help me implant these devices. And then we'll talk about patient-specific instrumentation and patient-specific implants. That's really been um, the big jump forward in technology, in my opinion, over the last several years. And that's something that we use commonly here at this hospital. So what is computer-assisted surgery? Well, on the left is, a, uh, is the actual computer that we own here at this hospital. It's made by a company called Stryker. And it's got this little sort of uh, sensor here that senses um, uh, electrical signals from these uh, pins or these um, devices that we implant into the knee right before surgery. And what it does is it sends signals out to the camera. The camera then registers those signals in a complex way that I don't completely understand. And then it generates a virtual three-dimensional model of the knee. And so about five maybe even longer than that, six or seven years ago, we started using this device and we used it commonly in almost all of our surgeries. This is really cool if you look at it. I mean, this is high tech and it seems to give you a lot of information that we wouldn't have otherwise. The problem with using this computer, as with any computer, is that, guess what, sometimes you turn it on and what happens? Nothing, right? There's nothing, nothing comes on. Or you'll get everything set up just perfect and in the middle of surgery, you start getting you know, errors in your data reads. And so um, even though it's a great piece of equipment and there are still doctors that use this nationally, this has fallen, in my opinion, somewhat out of favor because of the unreliability of computers. 
And furthermore, this is a very, very expensive piece of equipment. I don't even know what it costs, but it's, uh, I think, well over a million dollars. And the information that was coming out three and five years after this was starting to be commonly used was that it didn't really improve the outcomes of knee surgery significantly. I mean, the knees were a little bit better aligned. There's no question about that. And they were a little better sized. But the patients didn't, that had it didn't feel any different. So hospitals and doctors had a hard time spending a million dollars for a piece of equipment that didn't always work and didn't seem to make a huge difference. So even though we still have this piece of equipment, I'm not sure where it is exactly, but we still have this piece of equipment. I personally don't use it. One of my partners still uses it occasionally for some of his knees. And I'll use it in very rare occasions for uh, specific problems that I don't really want to go into. But by and large, this is just something that we uh, don't use so much anymore. So if we don't use computers during surgery, what can we use, what, how can we use computers to our advantage? Well, the major companies have come out with ways of making what's called patient-specific instruments. So if you remember that kind of gory slide that I showed you with all the bone and all that stuff with the big metal blocks? Well, companies have figured out a way to take either MRIs or CAT scans of your knee and then make these cutting blocks. This is where we insert the saw and the drills during surgery in these little slots in a way that is specifically designed for your knee. And so we as surgeons can say, hey, we want to cut, we can tell the engineers, we want to cut eight millimeters of bone here at a seven degree angle with a three degree slope. And they put that in their CAD models or whatever they do and they spit these out. And so these are shipped to us. And so now when I go in to do a knee replacement, I can use these on your knee. And these are one of a kind. These are only for you, nobody else. And they're relatively inexpensive and when we're done, you can either throw them away or we can give them to you and you can put them on your mantelpiece. But they really, really improve our ability as surgeons to align the knee in a way that's most appropriate for you. And so this one on the left is made by a company called Depew. It's uh, TrueMatch is the proprietary name. And it's based off of CAT scans. And this one on the right is made by a company called Biomet. And it's based off of MRI scans. And they look a little bit different, but they're essentially the same. And they add a few hundred dollars to the knee replacement, which can be a problem. It is a little bit of a problem now, but can become a problem in the future as uh, health uh, care reform and uh, Medicare cuts continue to kick in. But right now, this is something we're using commonly at this hospital. So that, those are patient-specific instruments. But this is what I think is really, really interesting and really, really exciting is what's called a patient-specific implant. So if you can take that technology that I was just telling you about where we take CAT scans and MRIs and make instruments for the knee, there's one company, Conformis, based out of Boston that's figured out a way and has a patent on using that information to actually not just make the instruments, but also make the implant. So if you look at the way this works, this looks a lot like that uh, total knee replacement I was showing you earlier. You know, same stuff, co shiny cobalt chrome up above, cobalt chrome down below, and high medical grade, high molecular weight plastic or polyethylene in between. But instead of being one of several sizes, this is one of one size based on your CAT scan that's specific to your knee. And there are a lot of advantages to that. This is uh, kind of what it looks like. This is um, a representation of this company's partial knee replacement, although they also have a total knee replacement. So what we do is if, if we decide that you're a candidate for a patient-specific knee, we'll get a CAT scan. We email that CAT scan to the company's headquarters. And then the engineers go to work designing an implant specific for you. They, you can see that the, the knee's not round and it's not square and it's not triangular. It's kind of a very complex geometrical shape. And so they're able to make an implant that perfectly fits and perfectly covers the damaged bony surfaces as well as the instruments that are necessary to put that in. So what does a patient-specific partial knee replacement offer? Well. Um, I think without question it offers a superior fit. I mean, many times we get lucky. I mean, the other companies have done a very good job of giving us a wide variety of sizes to choose from. So we can you know, choose between a three, three or a three and a half or a four or whatever to fit your knee. And it's going to fit really, really well. But it's not going to fit perfect every time. If you have a knee replacement that's made specifically for you, then it's likely going to fit pretty darn good. And I've implanted now over 100 of these devices over the last several years. I can't think of a single instance where it didn't fit well. I mean, they, they're good at what they do. And so we get full coverage on the femur and the tibia. We're not forced to choose between a little bit too big or a little bit too small. 
and we get the tibia in particular, the shin bone, we get the implant to fit all the way around the edge of the bone, which is important because that's where the densest or the, the strongest bone is to support the implant so that it doesn't loosen over time. The other advantage is, is that we can save bone. You know, when we put these implants in, I, saw, I showed you all the cuts that we make. You know, remember those five faceted cuts? Well, when we put these guys in, we just barely, barely trim the bone, barely shave it so that we can put the implant in so that if you ever did have to have the knee replaced again for whatever reason, most of the bone that you were born with or that you grew up with is still there. You're not missing a lot of bone, so it makes the second reconstruction, if you ever had to have one, a lot easier. So here's the different products that this company makes. This is the unicompartmental knee replacement. They've got these uh, kind of um, Apple iPod names. They have iUni, which is the unicompartmental uh, replacement. They've got the duo compartmental, which is the two-part replacement. And then they've got the iTotal, which, which rolled out about a little over a year ago, which is a total knee replacement. And all of these are one-of-a-kind implants made specifically for the patient who needs them. Um, this is a little bit more of the same on the uni, so I think I'll skip this. Duo, um, I put in a handful of these. Um, it's very rare in, in my experience anyway that somebody has only two parts of their knee involved with nothing whatsoever wrong with the third part of the knee where I think that this is going to be a great choice. I've, I've done these, especially in younger patients, people in their 30s and 40s who need knee replacement, um, but these are fairly rare. And then we have these totals that we've um, become very excited about. So this is what it looks like when we're in surgery. You know, typically when we do a total knee replacement, there's multiple, multiple pans of, of instruments. There's lots and lots of instruments because there's lots and lots of different sizes and options that the surgeon has to choose from. So we see the nurses and the sterilization reps coming into the room literally on dollies with, with you know, large trays of instruments stacked six or eight or ten feet high. When we come in to do uh, either a partial or a total knee replacement, this is what we get. We get a little kit. It's kind of neat. It has a few little patient-specific instruments. It's got a couple of disposable drills and drill bits, and it's got the implants in it, and it just comes in a simple little tray. So it makes the uh, setup for the surgery much more efficient. Hospitals like that, it takes less money and less time to prepare for the surgery and to clean up afterwards. And when we have it all laid out, this is pretty much every instrument that we use for the case on the back table just set out. So not a lot to it once it's all said and done. The process is if we decide that you're a candidate for this patient-specific um, process, we'll order a CAT scan. The CAT scan has to be done at a hospital that has proper software in installed on their machines in order to transmit it to the company. So this hospital has it. There's a few other facilities in town that has it. But if you live um, elsewhere or in another city, um, we can't always do the CAT scan at your local hospital because they don't always have the proper software. But anyway, we do the CAT scan, we send it to the company electronically, they go through this complex uh, three-dimensional mapping process, they make the implants and they make the jigs and they deliver it to us and that's typically about a four to six week turnaround time. I think we're currently down to about five weeks, even getting closer and closer to four weeks, but it takes you know, generally about a month to a month and a half to get these things ready. Um, here's just a representational case that I did probably a year or more ago on a guy that had unicompartmental or partial knee replacements of both knees. And I thought this was interesting because when we go into surgery, the engineers of the company prepare this little map or this guideline of, um, of what we're going to do. So, you know, they, they show us the bone spurs. All these things here are the bone spurs that we as surgeons are going to remove. They show us you know, where the um, jig is supposed to fit and how the implant is supposed to look when it's all said and done. But if you look at this, kind of, this is his right knee. So you look at this, he's got kind of a gentle curve going up towards the top where the knee sort of curves. And he's got on his tibia this tray that kind of just looks like the normal letter D. It's pretty symmetric with a you know, fat bulge on the side and a straight line down the side. And so sort of make a mental image of that. And then look at his opposite knee this is the same guy, but his left knee, look how this thing kind of really swings over quite a bit more, you know, almost at a 20 degree, 25 degree angle compared to this, which almost is straight. And look at the tibia, it's, it's shaped differently. Instead of having the big wide D shape, he's got sort of a narrow flange up here and sort of a wide area in the back. And so you can sort of imagine that if we had done this particular patient with off-the-shelf implants, 
probably one side would have fit better than the other side. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, this is what's done, you know, most commonly throughout the country and throughout the world. But we had the opportunity in his case to fit his knees very, very well, actually, you know, perfectly using this technology. And so it worked out very well for him. Um, this is the same sort of thing, only for the total knee replacement, the eye total. We have um, preoperative maps that we use, and uh, we, we give the engineers basic guidelines for you know, how we want the knee implanted, and then they fine tune it and give us the actual measures of resection. So on this knee, we're going to take 6.4 millimeters of bone off the inner side and 6.1 millimeters of bone off the outer side. Um, in a conventional knee with normal metallic instruments, these numbers would be closer to 8 and 10. So we're taking off significantly less bone, usually about 60% less bone. And we can measure this during surgery. We can look at this, we can measure it, make sure we like it, we can cut it. Then we can use um, calibrated you know, calipers to measure the bone and make sure that we're actually reproducing what our plan was. And then once we're all said and done, we can implant the device and that's what it looks like. So this is a question that comes up all the time. Uh, people come in and say, you know, my knee's hurting me a lot. Um, I just don't know if I'm ready. I'm just, I just don't know if I'm ready to have this done. And that's, you know, that's fair. <coughs> Surgery is a big step for anybody. What happens is, um, as the arthritis progresses, you lose more and more cartilage. And as you've lost all of your cartilage, you start to lose more and more bone. And not only that, as you're waiting to, and trying to decide whether surgery is right for you, <coughs> your pain's not getting any better, right? I mean, we can give you the shots or we can give you the pills or whatever, but you're still having pain in your knee. So what I see, at least on a daily basis in the office, is someone who brings in their mom or brings in their dad and says, you know, dad's been suffering with this for 15 years, and he's finally decided it hurts so bad that he can't get it done or he's going to get it done. And so you say, sir, you know, what, what's been going on in your life? Well, you know, the family went to Europe last summer, but I didn't go because my knee hurt too bad. Or, you know, the family's you know, family likes to take trips in the camper, but I don't go anymore because my knee hurts too bad. So not only is your knee getting worse, but your pain isn't getting any better. So you may be missing out on things in life that you could be enjoying if your knee pain were, were gone or were, re were removed. And so those are very compelling reasons to think about having this done earlier rather than later. And if you're older, you know, if you're in your 70s or 80s, then in general in life as we get older, we don't get healthier as we get older, right? So our high blood pressure, you know, may get worse. Our diabetes may get out of control. Our heart disease may become more of a problem and so forth. So what could have been surgery that was done relatively easily five or 10 years ago, later in life now becomes more difficult because now now that you're 80 and you could have, could have had it done when you're 70, you're now taking blood thinners because the doctor put a stent in your heart and you're taking all these pills for your blood pressure and so on and so forth. So there are some reasons at least to consider having this done earlier rather than later. And the final thing is that osteoarthritis is degenerative. There are lots and lots of really, really exciting um, biological solutions to all sorts of problems in, in healthcare, including stem cells and, you know, um, gene manipulation therapy and so on and so forth. But I go to these meetings and I read the journals and I stay update with all the, the, the latest and greatest stuff. There's really nothing for arthritis that's going to make this go away magically in the next, you know, five, maybe ten years. There's, ex there's exciting, exciting experimental therapies. But as of we, you know, as of today, September 2013, there's not an easy fix or a way to reverse osteoarthritis. And so, if you choose to delay surgery, it is going to likely get slowly worse over time, and it's very unlikely to spontaneously get better. So in summary, uh, knee replacement surgery is extremely common. We talked about that 800,000 procedures done last year. The technological innovations, especially in my opinion, the use of computers prior to surgery for both in instruments and implants, have led to outcomes that should become better as time goes by and should make our results somewhat more predictable. And every person is unique. You know, all of these technologies that I'm showing you aren't right for everybody. I mean, um, I use patient-specific instruments and patient-specific implants for the vast majority of knees that I do. But there's a whole variety of factors that influence why we choose one over the other or why, in some cases, we can't use either. So um, we have to individualize treatment for everybody. There's no way to cookbook this. 
So I think that's it. Um, that's the talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I hope that was at least somewhat helpful.